Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in that hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things with Chris James, broadcasting from the auxiliary radio station for Arkansas Radio in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. Tonight we're going to be talking about underground cities. I have David Subeth to thank for tonight's show. I don't know if I got the same one he sent me. I couldn't open the page he sent, so I went to similar sites to try getting the story. After I dug and searched, I realized I could get the page to open using Messenger, and by this time I had a lot of info, so I tried to squeeze everything together. Some sites gave the same stories, with others just glossing over some of the details, so I hammered it out the best I could, and hopefully this is what he was looking for. I finally found a new soundboard. It's from Farago. Not too expensive, and it came with a bunch of sound effects, which I promptly got rid of. If you're looking for a soundboard, give them a look. Not bad. It works. That's the important thing. I bought one back when my soundboard first quit working, and the free sample worked great. You could record on the soundboard. Everything was perfect. It's like, hey, this thing was designed for me, for a podcaster. So I paid the 60 or $70, whatever it was, to get the thing, and I loaded it onto my computer. And Well, for some odd reason, the one I paid for didn't work like the free one that they were showing. So I contacted the company They tried to fix it. Uh, Finally, they gave me my money back. Later on, I went back to that same site, and that particular soundboard was no longer there. I guess they discovered there were some major problems with it. So, well, that's adventures in podcasting. In April 1885, an article appeared in the New York Times concerning a discovery at the bottom of a mine in Moberly, Missouri. Uh, David Coates, the recorder of the city of Moberly, I guess that would be like the historian or the city secretary, and Mr. George Keating, the city marshal, were informed by miners that something incredible had been found while digging into the earth. Their investigation uncovered a city 360 feet below the surface. According to the article, a series of lava arches was found in a buried city, the streets of which were regularly laid out and enclosed by walls of stone, which was cut and dressed in a fairly good, although rude, style of masonry. They found a hall that was 30 by 100 feet, with stone benches and tools of all descriptions for mechanical use. Further search disclosed statues and images made of composition closely resembling bronze. Everything was built to a giant proportion. The underground city was unearthed underneath coal seams. A coal would have formed during the Carboniferous period about 354 to 290 million years ago. This could mean that the lost city of Missouri would be at least 300 million years old. According to the guys in the white lab coats, there were no humans on the earth 300 million years ago. The theory of evolution teaches that the first human-like beings appeared about 300 to 400,000 years ago. A theory means something people believe happened but hasn't been proven. The theory of evolution 
uh, came about when some supposedly smart folks decided they didn't want to believe in God, uh, so they didn't have to behave. The theory of evolution is flawed. There are several discoveries that clearly show someone was walking on this planet millions of years ago. It is not surprising that more scientists start to question the age and origins of man. Some people have gone as far as to say that humans did not come from Africa, but Australia instead. <clears throat> The discovery of a city buried beneath a coal mine is extraordinary. Finding out who built it and where they went could be interesting. A super ancient city found underground that might be millions of years old. The men began searching the city, looking for anything that might answer their questions. As they walked along what might have been the main street, the men came to a fountain. Lying beside the fountain were portions of a human skeleton. The bones of the legs were huge. The femur, that's your thigh bone, was four foot six inches. The tibia, your shin bone, was four feet three inches. Just the leg was eight foot nine inches long. Whoever this leg belonged to was 17 or 18 feet tall. The head bones had separated in two places along the sagittal and coronal sutures. Ah, coronal sutures. The searchers couldn't tell if this was due to some accident or maybe somebody had hit this giant with some equally huge weapon. Laying on the ground near the giant skeleton were some tools. Implements found were bronze and flint knives, stone and granite hammers, metallic saws, and other tools or weapons. These items looked to have been made by some very advanced civilization. <clears throat> the New York Times article ends by writing that a further extended search will be made in a day or two. Unfortunately, there is no more information available on this discovery. Mr. Keating and Mr. Coates both died within eight years of the discovery in 1893 and 1892. Either they never bothered to write down what they had found down there in the bottom of the coal mine, or all their papers were gathered up by those folks who want to control everything we believe. The story of the underground city, as well as the giant bones, vanished from any written record. More than likely, the Smithsonian swooped in and took possession of everything. Once they had all the evidence secreted away in some vault, the museum officials said the bones had actually belonged to a dinosaur, and the city was just an odd cave system that kind of looked like a man-made construction. Why would they do such a thing? First of all, in 1845, the idea of manifest destiny came along. This was the doctrine or belief that the expansion of the U.S. throughout the American continent was both justified and inevitable. Those Indians were just riding around the countryside not really owning any of the ground that they lived on. The Indians didn't build any cities or put up any monuments, so allowing the settlers to move in and push the locals out was justifiable. All the Indian mounds found all over the place were just piles of dirt. Those huge cities built along the cliffs were built by somebody else. This was the thought process used to make the theft of land and the displacement of the Indians okay. In 1846, the Smithsonian was founded. They were supposed to tell the history of our country, but instead, they only told the parts they thought we should know. If the Indians were in the way of manifest destiny, then the Indians had to go. 
Any things found that just might say somebody living in the United States before settlers moved in had to go as well. Giants just didn't fit into any of the image the scientists at the Smithsonian had of how the history of the United States should look. Any evidence of giants or ancient cities had to be dealt with. A city beneath the ground in Missouri is not the only unexplained discovery. There are reports of a 5,000-year-old underground city hidden somewhere beneath Death Valley, California as well. Those who entered the subterranean tunnels and visited this marvelous place said the city was once inhabited by an unknown race. The explorers who were able to visit the underground city found mummies and weird artifacts they could not explain. Now, thousands of years later, the place had been abandoned by the vic visitors saw strange mummies and curious old artifacts. For centuries, legends of an underground city and an ancient race in Death Valley have been told in the Paiute legend of the Kingdom of Shin Avav. Jim, Brandon's, Jim Brandon wrote in his book, Weird America, how several thousand years ago a great Paiute chief lost his wife. Filled with sorrow and convinced that life was not worth living, he ventured into the underground spirit kingdom. He passed through an endless underground passage, following the trail of all brave Indian spirits. He was attacked by fierce beasts, evil spirits, and supernatural monsters. The chief was very brave, and he fought his way through the ghoulish cavern. Eventually, his quest led to an opening in the far end of the tunnel. As he stepped out onto a ledge, the chief found himself standing on a cliff, looking out on a vast green meadow. This was the kingdom of shin -a -av, the land of the dead. There were people who looked human. One of them was the daughter of the ruler. She took the chief by the hand and led him to a vast natural amphitheater. It was a public place, and many thousands of Paiute were dancing in a huge circle. These were the long-dead ancestors of the tribe. The Paiute chief said he wanted to see his wife. The female told him that once he and his wife were reunited, they must both leave the valley quickly without a single backward glance. The Paiute chief promised he would do as he was told. There were so many Indian spirits in the circle, it took several days and nights before the chief spotted his wife. He waded into the throng and made his way to his dearly departed. Once the two were reunited, the chief told his wife they were going back to the surface, back to the land of the living. <clears throat> Together, they fled across the valley to the rock arch, which would take them back to the tunnel, which led up to the surface. Curiosity can be a bad thing. As the two made their way out of the vast meadow, the chief wanted one last look. He turned and glanced back at the land of the dead. The instant he looked back, his wife vanished into thin air, and he found himself standing alone. With a heavy heart, the chief made his way back up the tunnel. He rejoined his tribe, and he spent the remainder of his days describing the beautiful and luxurious land of shin -a -av. His story became well known to the Paiute. In the 1920s, an Indian guide, Tom Wilson, told about how his grandfather had discovered catacombs below the ground in the area of Death Valley. His grandfather said he had discovered a labyrinth several miles long of bizarre caves beneath the valley floor. 
He followed one of the bigger tunnels, which took him into an underground city, where people spoke an unknown language and they wore leather-like clothing. The grandfather left the underground city and never went back. This story might be something to entertain his grandkids, but it's not the only one about this city under Death Valley. Two men named White and Thompson said they found some catacombs under one, after one of them had fallen through the bottom of an old mine shaft near Wingate Pass in southwest corner of Death Valley. After making sure he wasn't hurt, the two men looked around to see if there was anything of value in this shaft. After following the shaft a short ways, the men found themselves in a natural underground cavern. Wanting to know if there might be something down there, the men began exploring the huge cave. They found a tunnel that went 20 miles north into the heart of the Panamint Mountains. At the end of this tunnel, the two men found a huge ancient underground cavern city. There were what looked like some kind of ancient lighting system led by subterranean gas. Looking around this underground city, they found several perfectly preserved mummies, which were clad in fine leather and wore thick gold armbands and held gold spears. As they searched, the men found a large, polished, round table, which looked as if it may have been part of an ancient council chamber. Around the table were giant statues made of gold. There were stone vaults and drawers full of gold bars and gemstones of all kinds. Along the walls were huge stone doors, which were perfectly balanced by counterweights. The two men brought some of the treasure out of the cavern, only what they could carry the full length of the twenty-mile tunnel. They tried to set up a deal with scientists associated with the Smithsonian Institute in order to gain help to explore and publicize the city as one of the many wonders of the world. A so-called friend of theirs stole the treasure, wishing to sell it for the monetary value not interested in any historic significance. Making matters worse, they were scoffed at and rejected by the scientists when they tried to take them to the mine, only to be not able to find it. The searchers thought that either there had been a flash flood or maybe somebody had destroyed the landmarks. The folks from the Smithsonian announced there was nothing to see and left the area. Based on many encounters with the folks from the Smithsonian, these guys just might have had something, if not everything, to do with the mine being impossible to find. The discovery of a giant underground citadel near the Grand Canyon appeared in the Arizona Gazette in 1909. As scientists have debated whether the story is true or a hoax. As several alternative history authors and researchers, among them David Hatcher Childress, have believed the discovery did occur, and this is yet another archaeological cover-up. The newspaper said, the latest news of the progress of the exploration of what is now regarded by scientists is not only the oldest archaeological discovery in the United States, but one of the most valuable in the world that was mentioned as some time ago in the Gazette was brought to the city yesterday by G. E. Kincaid, the explorer who found the great underground citadel of the Grand Canyon during a trip from Green River, Wyoming, down the Colorado in a wooden boat several months ago. According to the story related to the Gazette, Mr. Kincaid 
the archaeologist of the Smithsonian Institute, which is financing the expedition, have made discoveries which almost conclusively prove that a race which inhabited this mysterious cavern, hewn in solid rock by human hands, was of oriental origin, possibly from Egypt, tracing back to the Ramses. Kincaid said, if their theories came from the translation of the tablets engraved with hieroglyphics, the mystery of the prehistoric people of North America, their ancient arts, who they were and whence they came, will be solved. Egypt and the Nile and Arizona and Colorado will be linked by a historic chain running back to ages which staggers the wildest fancies of the fictionists. They used to talk really different back then. <clears throat> Under the direction of Professor S.A. Jordan, the Smithsonian Institution is now prosecuting the most thorough exploration which will be continued until the last link in the chain is forged. Nearly a mile underground, about 1,480 feet below the surface, that's not really near a mile, but nearly a mile below the surface, that's what the newspaper said, the long main passage has been delved into to find another mammoth chamber from which radiates scores of passageways kind of like the spokes of a wheel. The paper went on to describe the rooms found that were at the ends of these spokes. The researchers found all manner of artifacts that the local Indian tribes said was not theirs nor their ancestors. Some of the rooms held mummified bodies, something the Indians didn't do. Weapons Copper instruments, sharp-edged and hard as steel, indicate the high state of civilization reached by these strange people. Many of these items look as if they were from the Middle East or maybe the Far East. The scientists from the Smithsonian told anyone who would listen to stay away. They didn't want any interruptions while they looked into all of those rooms. The entrance to the cave is nearly inaccessible to get to. The entrance is 1,486 feet down the sheer canyon wall. It is located on government land, and no visitors are allowed there under penalty of trespass. Kincaid was traveling along the Colorado River, passing through the Grand Canyon, when he spotted what looked like a cave opening 2,000 feet up the side of the wall. If you've never been to the Grand Canyon, you're missing a breathtaking experience. Uh, try not to go in the middle of the winter, though. It, it's really cold. <laughs> the opening in the cliff face appeared to have had steps carved into the face of the canyon wall that must have collapsed over the years. The paper continued with Kincaid's story, saying... The tomb or crypt in which the mummies were found is one of the largest of the chambers. The walls slant back at an angle of about 35 degrees. The passages are chiseled or hewn as straight as could be laid out by any engineer. The ceilings of many of the rooms converge to a center. The side passages near the entrance run at a sharp angle from the main hall, but towards the rear they gradually reach a right angle in direction. A hundred feet from the entrance is a cross hall, several hundred feet long, in which are found an idol or image of the people's god, sitting cross-legged with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. This sounds more like Buddha than any Egyptian god. Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked-necked and distorted shapes, symbolic probably of good and evil. There are two large cactus with protruding arms, one on each side of the dais on which the god squats. 
All this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. Also found in this underground city were vases or urns and cups of copper and gold, made very artistic in design. The pottery work included enameled ware and glazed vessels. Another passageway leads to a granary, which are usually found in oriental temples. These rooms contained seeds of various kinds. The walls of these passages had hieroglyphics on them that looked more like something from ancient Egypt. All of the mummies examined proved to be male. There were no children, females, or animals buried in the Grand Canyon. Among the Hopi Indians, the tradition is told that their ancestors once lived in an underground city in Grand Canyon. When dissension arose between the people of the One Heart and the bad folks in the city, Macheto, their chief, counseled them to leave the underground world. But there was no way out. The chief then caused a tree to grow up and pierce the roof of the underworld, and then the people of One Heart climbed out. They resettled by Pasivia. Pasivia. Well, they settled by a river, which is also known as the Red River, and better known as the Colorado River. The people established their village and began growing corn and beans. They sent out a messenger to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessing of peace, goodwill, and rain for the people of one heart. The messenger never returned. Even today, at some of the Hopi villages, you might see an old man standing on one of the rooftops gazing towards the sun. He is looking for the messenger to return. When he does, their land and ancient dwelling place will be restored to them, that is their tradition. There are a few theories of the origins of the Egyptians. One is that they came from Asia. Another says that the racial cradle was in the Upper Nile region. There's a theory that says the Egyptians might have come from an Indian tribe that once lived in or near the Grand Canyon. The discoveries in the Grand Canyon may throw further light on human evolution and prehistoric ages. When I say human evolution, I'm not talking about an ape that turned into a human. I'm talking about how people change over the years. We, we evolve from one way of doing things to another. So you've got human evolution and then you've got the theory of evolution. They're two different things. A David Hatcher Childress said, Perhaps the most amazing suppression of all is the excavation of an Egyptian tomb by the Smithsonian itself in Arizona. A lengthy front-page story of the Phoenix Gazette, April 5, 1909, gave a highly detailed report of the discovery and excavation of a rock-cut vault by an expedition led by Professor S.A. Jordan of the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, however, claims to have absolutely no knowledge of the discovery or its discoverers. The World Explorers Club had decided to check on this story by calling the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They felt there was little chance of getting any real information, but they thought they'd give it a shot anyway. After briefing, briefly speaking to an operator, they were transferred to a Smithsonian staff archaeologist. A woman's voice came on the phone and identified herself. The club representative told her that he was investigating a story from the 1909 Phoenix newspaper article about the Smithsonian institutions having excavated the rock-cut vault in the Grand Canyon where Egyptian artifacts had been discovered and whether the Smithsonian Institution could give them any more information on the subject. The woman said, There are no Egyptian artifacts of any kind 
ever found in North or South America. Therefore, the Smithsonian Institution has never been involved in any such excavation. They said she was quite helpful and polite, but in the end knew nothing. Neither she nor anyone else with whom the rep spoke could find any record of the discovery or either G.E. Kincaid or Professor S.A. Jordan. While it cannot be discounted that the entire story is an elaborate newspaper hoax, the fact that it was on the front page, named the prestigious Smithsonian Institute, and gave a highly detailed story that went on for several pages, lends a great deal to its credibility. It would have had to have been a very slow news day for the paper to run such an elaborate story, knowing it was all made up. In fact, it would have to have been a very slow news week, because they ran several updates of the story. To me, it looks more like the story was true, but the Smithsonian did what they do best, and cover up the truth. I keep hearing experts that say ancient people were afraid to sail too far from the coast because the earth was flat and they would fall off the edge. The earliest documented mention of the spherical earth concept dates from around the 5th century BC when it was mentioned by ancient Greece philosophers. In the 3rd century BC, Hellenistic astronomy established the roughly spherical shape of the Earth as a physical fact and they calculated the Earth's circumference. The people in Europe probably did believe the Earth was flat at one stage, but that was in the very early ancient period, possibly around the 4th century BC, the very early phases of European civilization. The folks living in the Middle East, North America, North Africa, and Asia knew the earth was round. They knew how to sail. Why someone wouldn't have said, I wonder what's over the horizon, is beyond me. I grew up being told that Columbus had to force his crew to sail away from Europe. They all thought they would fall off the edge of the earth. They taught this in school. Then I learned the people wanted to go with Columbus were so numerous they could pick and choose from the best. Everybody wanted to be in on the voyage because it could mean tremendous wealth for one and all of them. The big question now seems to be, did ancient Egyptians come to America thousands of years ago, or did ancient Indians travel to Egypt thousands of years ago. And with that happy thought, I'll take a brief pause and play a few commercials. This is Arkanasa Radio you've been listening to. Did you stay up all night watching horror movies and now you think your house might be haunted? Contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society and have them come by and check out your house. Maybe you accidentally invited a ghost or a spirit, or maybe it's just the plumbing. You can contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at LaredoParanormal at Hotmail.com. It's a bird. It's a plane. I need to get my eyes checked. Where am I going to get my eyes checked? Why, at Optica del Norte, 107 Cayle del Norte, right across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson. The best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from 
theorganicmancoffeetrike.shop. Isn't it about time you did something for your skin besides mistreat it? Contact Lourdes James at 956-723-3019 and take care of your skin with a free skincare class. And there you have it, my brand new soundboard. Hopefully it sounds as good at y'all end as it does at mine. It's kind of hard to tell because, well, I'm listening to it here in my office and y'all are listening to it hopefully on the computer or your smartphone or something and there might be a difference. Anyway, in 1956, best-selling book called The Third Eye, which is an autobiographical account of a man named Tuesday Labsong Rampa, he tells his experiences at Chakpuri Lamasari in Tibet. <clears throat> Among the wealth of stories in the book, Rampa tells about how he tried to operate on himself by drilling a hole into his own head in order to release mysterious mental powers. This is known as trepaning. There is evidence of skulls with brain surgery or trepanation between 7000 B.C. and 1400 A.D., found in Europe, South America, Egypt, and India. The Baja Pramada... Praba... Okay, why can't the Indians spell these things a little nicer? The Braha Prama... I'm not even going to try it. Anyway, in this book, written by Raja Baj of Paramar, around 1050 A.D., described the process. Anybody out there speaks Indian? It's not called Indian, it's called Hindi. Anybody out there speaks Hindi? Let me know how that's supposed to be pronounced. <laughs> if I butchered it, sorry, I don't speak Hindi. Anyway. Also in the third eye, a Tuesday Lobsong Rampa told of finding his own mummified body from a past life in a subterranean city he had visited under the Tibetan capital of Lhasa. Oh, and by the way, yes, I do look these words up, how to pronounce them. I listen to the proper pronunciation. I practice saying the proper pronunciation. And then when I sit down to do the show that entire thing goes out the window. I've even tried writing it out phonetically, and it still doesn't come out right. Maybe it's because I don't speak other languages. I can barely speak English. What the heck? Anyway, beneath the palace of the Dalai Lama, he joined a priest to explore a system of caves whose walls were adorned with strange symbols and drawings by unknown hands. Following one tunnel down into the darkness, Rampa said he came across a vast cavern with an underground lake and a ceiling so high he could not discern its height as the light did not reach all the way up the soaring chasm above. The guy could really speak. Here the walls held mysterious geometric diagrams as well as pictures of giants and machines the likes of which he had never imagined, along with inscrutable writing in some puzzling alien language. They then took a side passageway that took them to an area with a black house, within which were contained three sarcophagi, apparently made of a smooth black stone, which was similar to obsidian, in which were carved with an array of strange symbols and what looked to be a star map. Within these were the bodies of strange giant beings, which the priest who had accompanied him explained as being the bodies of ancient gods who had come to their world eons before. Rampa said of these bodies, I looked again, fascinated and awed, Three gold figures, naked, lay before us. 
two male and one female. Every line, every mark faithfully reproduced by the gold. The size. The female was ten feet long as she lay, and the larger of the two males was not under fifteen feet. Their heads were large and somewhat conical. The jaws were narrow, with small, thin lips. The nose was long and thin, while the eyes were straight and deeply recessed. No dead figures, these. They looked as if they were asleep. The two men continued their journey through the complex spider-web of dank caverns, tunnels, and passageways. Rampa said they came across fantastic creatures the likes of which he had never seen. There was a brightly lit room hidden behind a sliding wall panel which held an array of strange dormant machines whose purposes he could not fathom. When this tour was finished, Rampa said he had then gained a new ability to look through time and that he saw visions of the ancient ages when these enigmatic giants had, had been ruling the earth. January 1934 edition of the LA Times, there was an article that told of the amazing discoveries of a geophysical engineer by the name of G. Warren Shuffelt. He believed he had actually managed to locate and prove that an ancient, mysterious, inhuman race that he called Lizard People had lived in a vast underground cavern system under the ground where Los Angeles would be built some day. A Shuffelt learned of this subterranean complex from an old Native American man named Macklin, who explained to him that this was one of three such lost cities located along the Pacific coast. These cities had been built by a forgotten race of reptilian creatures that used to live in the area. The legend said these creatures had retreated underground after a huge tongue of fire measuring several hundred miles wide, had wiped out everything in its path about 5,000 years ago. Shuffelt said the lost city had been dug using powerful chemicals instead of traditional picks and shovels. The lizard people positioned these tunnels so they could have access to the Pacific Ocean. The tide rolling in and out each day would enter and exit the lower tunnels causing air to circulate through the upper tunnels. This would flush out any stale air and put fresh oxygen in the mostly closed city. The movement of the tide also took away any garbage and waste produced by the inhabitants of the underground city. Large rooms were constructed allowing for thousands of family units to live in comfort. The idea of a lizard man family is hard to get my head around. Really kind of odd because I can picture Bigfoot families living in the woods, but lizards just don't strike me as family oriented. The underground city had vast food stores and places used to grow fresh items like mushrooms. There were also vaults filled with gold, silver, and jewels. The place was to keep the lizard people alive until the surface was safe to return to. This underground city also contained huge gold tablets inscribed with historical information dealing with all manner of ancient knowledge like how humans came to live on the surface and why the reptilians were here. Each tablet was said to be four feet long and fourteen inches across. There were also many relics and valuable artifacts in this underground city. A Sheffelt was mesmerized by this incredible story and scurried the region searching for this lost city. He managed to locate it through radio x-rays, which allowed him to map out the intricate array of tunnels, caverns, and catacombs, as well as find the deposits of gold. 
Radio X-ray was a device that was supposed to penetrate the ground, like ground-penetrating radar that is used all over the planet today. In the 1930s, there were no GPR units. However, some folks did have weird electronic devices that may or may not have worked. The folks in the white lab coats will say it was impossible, but then they say that about everything they don't like to talk about. A Sheffelt worked the ground using his bizarre device from the public library on West 5th Street to the Southwest Museum on Museum Drive at the foot of Mount Washington. He said he had found a vast, intricate system of tunnels that ran under the ground, connecting huge rooms. In some of these rooms, Sheffelt said he could see or make out images that to him looked like gold or jewels. Sheffelt said he had managed to make tentative maps of the system using his equipment, that he had been able to take radio x-ray photographs of 37 of the legendary tablets, three of which had had their southwestern corners cut off. He also came to the conclusion that these lizard people had been very advanced for their time and had lined the tunnels and the rooms with a type of sophisticated cement far stronger than anything humans possessed. A Sheffelt believed that he had captured proof of all of this, and he went about launching an excavation to bore down through the earth to reach this mysterious lost city. His workers managed to dig down to 250 feet towards what Sheffelt thought was going to be one of the tunnels just short of a pile of gold. His pit didn't open on to anything. A Sheffelt wanted to dig deeper. He was going to extend his dig site as deep as a thousand feet. He talked to the reporters that were almost always hanging around him watching his progress. As if a switch was thrown, there were no further updates on his progress or what he managed to find. Shortly after the last newspaper article, the city of Los Angeles pulled all of Shuffelt's permits to investigate. He tried to renew them, but ran into a brick wall at City Hall. About a year later, the city did allow an oil company to drill for oil inside the city limits. Surprisingly, or maybe not, the drill sites were all in locations where Shuffelt had thought he had found evidence of gold and silver vaults under the ground. There are no reports on whether or not any gold was ever pulled from any of these oil exploration wells. As for the underground city, the folks in charge may have found something, but they're not telling us anything. In Japan, there's supposed to be a mysterious underground civilization located beneath Mount Tsurugi in Tokushima Prefecture. In 1930, a scholar named Masanari Takani noticed several peculiar parallels between the Bible and a legendary Japanese book called the Kojiki, which means Record of Ancient Matters. He examined the two records as side by side and came to the conclusion the Ark of the Covenant had ended up being secreted away within Mount Saguri. 1936, Masanari began a three-year project digging into the mountain in search of the lost Ark as well as many ancient artifacts that would have accompanied the holy relic. For those that don't no, which I imagine there's one or two. The Ark was built by the Israelites right after they escaped from Pharaoh and began their long adventure wandering back and forth in the desert. The Ark had to be kept guarded and contained so no one accidentally came in contact with it, which would have been bad. Once the Israelites were established in Jerusalem, the Ark was given a permanent place inside the stone temple. The Babylonians attacked Jerusalem in 586 B.C. and ransacked the entire city. The temple was broken into, but there is no record of the ark ever being taken. 
Uh, stories began to circulate saying the Ark was whisked away late at night using tunnels under the city. It was taken to... Pick a location you like. I've heard it wound up in Ethiopia, South America, Central America, Arkansas, yes, the state, Nova Scotia, as in Oak Island, India, China, as well as just about every country in Europe. Masanori Tokani dug into the side of Mount Saguri and found a warren of tunnels that went all over under the mountain. These tunnels led to rooms, some small, while others were big enough to hold thousands of people. Masanari believed that these tunnels had been carved out under the mountain by ancient race which lived on the island hundreds or maybe thousands of years before man. The three-year dig turned into a 20-year exploration of the inside of the mountain. Many intrepid explorers came to see what might be found, drawn by the mystery of the unknown as well as the possibility of becoming rich. In 1952, former naval admiral Isuki Yamamoto discovered what appeared to be marble corridors within the mountain, as well as human mummies that had not withstood the test of time well. Many of these mummies were just piles of dust that if you touched them, they fell apart into nothing. Takani and Yamamoto suddenly and inexplicably stopped all further excavations and attempts to find the Ark shortly after these mummies had been found. Makes me wonder if they found something that scared them off, or were they told they had best stop or something was going to happen to them. A treasure hunter, Yashun Mayunaka, in 1956, came to Mount Saguru, Sarugi, get the right location, Mount Sar Sarugi, <laughs> wanting to get to the bottom of what others had failed to accomplish. As he and his team were getting geared up for the excavation, the law stepped in and stopped them. The creation of a nature preserve called Saguri San Kiso National Park, which included Mount Saguri and much of the surrounding area, was initiated in 1964 and made it illegal for anyone to dig into the mountain or any of the parts around it. Mayanaka was forced to abandon his search empty-handed. It also meant no one else would be able to look for the Ark in all of the artifacts, tunnels, corridors, and mummies that were found within the mountain. Those who wish to keep the rest of us in the dark about anything they don't like weld way too much power. This makes me think maybe the folks who don't want us looking into these underground cities might just be connected to them somehow, like Maybe they are the descendants of the ancients who built them. Something like that. Or maybe the ancients are pulling their strings like puppets. There's a city beneath Seattle, Washington, but we know who built it. In 1899, the Great Seattle Fire wiped out the area known as Pioneer Square. Once the fire was under control, or actually it had run out of things to burn, it was decided to rebuild, only this time they would use bricks and stones instead of wood. The city officials also decided to raise the city above sea level. The shop owners knew the work was going to take some time, so they reopened many of their stores and businesses that had been destroyed. The plans called for the street to be from 12 to 30 feet higher than they had been before the fire. The owners had their buildings put up within the soon-to-be entrances on the second or third floor, and sometimes the fourth floor. As the city workers moved along the streets, raising the city as they went, the stores would close the downstairs doors and move everything to the level of the street. This gave some buildings basements and sub-basements, and even sub-sub-basements. 
The streets connecting these underground floors were still there, so shop owners used them to move goods from place to place, avoiding all of the street traffic. Criminals began using the underground to kidnap people to be used as slave labor or prostitution. All manner of illegal activity took place in the underground city of Seattle. The remnants of the previous ground level still saw some use for a couple of decades, but in 1907 it was finally condemned out of fear that it was helping spread the bubonic plague. The underground was closed off and left. In 1965, the underground city found a new use. The Bill Spidell Underground Tour reignited interest in the bizarre piece of Seattle history. Around this time, much of Pioneer Square was under a threat of development, and Spidell saw the underground as an opportunity to preserve the historic streets and buildings. Eventually, he helped get half a million signatures to save Pioneer Square. I first became aware of the underground city beneath Seattle in 1973. My favorite reporter was investigating a series of murders, and he was drawn into the underground looking for answers. Carl Kolschak was looking for the Night Strangler, the second pilot of the series The Night Stalker. At first I thought the streets under the city were just a product of Hollywood writers. When I looked into it, being a curious person, I was amazed to find out there really is a subterranean city beneath Seattle. I like the Night Stalker series so much I bought the DVD collection. I've also read the books. There are a few misspellings, but it's still worth reading. You can watch Cole Shack battling the forces of darkness on YouTube, but you have to put up with all those annoying ads, and the shows are not in any kind of an order. In South America is the Andes Mountain Range, which runs through Ecuador and is said to house an underground city. The Cave of Talos is hidden in the rainforests where the indigenous Shwar people live. They are headhunters who guard their secrets with an iron will. One of their most tightly kept secrets is the location of the Cave of Talos. Evidence of the cave first showed up when a Christian holy man named Father Crespi went to the village of the Shwar people and befriended them. At the time, anyone living in the jungle was considered less than human. The Shwar were ignored up until somebody wanted the land that they lived on. A Father Crespi helped them and asked for nothing in return. His main concern was bringing the word of God to these folks and doing as Jesus had taught. The Schwar began to look at the old man, and they liked him, and so they gave him presents to thank him for his kindness. The presents that they gave him were very unique. The things he would get were often figures and statues of people and things that had nothing to do with the Schwar culture. These things sometimes included pieces made out of gold and silver. The gifts he received, which was the most interesting, was a set of mysterious metal tablets which had strange symbols on them. The writing was in characters no one had ever seen before and no one was able to translate. People believed these items came from the caves of Talos. A 1976 British explorer, Stanley Hall, took it upon himself to find the mysterious cave. He was as interested in finding who wrote the tablets as finding the gold and the treasure along with them. He recruited a group of over a hundred people to help in his search. Neil Armstrong was among the searchers. The explorers searched the jungles and mountains of Ecuador. According to Hall's records, 65 British soldiers and scientists 
arrived in Quito in July 1, 1976 and joined up with an equally large group of national and international scientists and the Ecuadorian military. The locals were not happy with all the secrecy surrounding the expedition. Usually, when a group of scientists went looking for anything, the locals would be hired to help out. This expedition was using only outsiders. Hull said a joint operation would allow the explorers to apply for different permit while still maintaining the title deed to any discovered artifacts. I can understand using Ecuadorian army personnel. You're going into the jungle where there are creatures that might want to eat you. There will also be tribes who are hostile to anyone trespassing through their lands. You need to have some folks with guns. But what's with the British soldiers? There were other things that are hard to explain. The scientific expedition had two helicopters and a fixed-wing airplane that all came from the military. The expedition was sounding more like a military operation than scientific. After months in the jungle, the expedition pulled out and said they had only found a few odd items of scientific value. There are many who say the expedition found things, but they kept them to themselves. Numerous investigators have reported that the Stanley Hall expedition shipped out 11 sealed wooden crates. These boxes had been loaded into the helicopters and whisked away. The official story was these were just artifacts being taken back to the university to be studied. As the expedition was packing up to leave, four more huge wooden boxes were shipped out. The Schwar, who owned the land where the cave had been found, none of their people were allowed to see what were in these boxes. Anyone asking was told, there's nothing to see here. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, and all that. Instead of allowing the locals to see what had been taken from them, the soldiers fired the rifles into the air and drove the shore away. 1991, Stanley Hall tracked down an Ecuadorian named Pretorio Aramillo. Aramillo said that he had visited the cave 1946, the one that Hall was looking for. He says that he had to draw, he had to dive into a river and swim through an underwater cave and came up inside the cave. Once inside, he walked through halls and rooms. He says there were statues and carvings of the things that looked exactly like the artifacts Father Crespi had been given. He also says there were hundreds and thousands of metal books that looked like the tablet that Father Crespi had. Aramillo died before he could show Hall the location of the entrance to the cave. The search for the Talos cave was started due to the one man, Father Carlos Crespi Croce. He was a, he was a Salesian, Salesian monk who was born in Italy in 1891. He studied anthropology at the University of Milan before becoming a priest. 1923, he was assigned to the small Andean city of Cuenca in Ecuador to work among the indigenous people. It was here that he devoted 59 years of his life to charitable work until his death in 1982. Now, Father Crespi is known for his multitude of talents. He was an educator, anthropologist, botanist, artist, explorer, a cinematographer, and a musician, as well as his intense humanitarian efforts in Ecuador. The city of Cuenca has been working with the Vatican for years now to have Father Crespi recognized as a saint. Over time, Father Crespi acquired more than 50 thousand objects, many of which were kept in the courtyard of the Church of Maria Auxiliadora until the Vatican gave him permission to start a museum to house the collection. Unfortunately, many of the artifacts were destroyed in a fire in 1962. After Father Crespi died, 
the remaining artifacts were removed and little trace of them remained. Uh, some have claimed that the Schwar came and took everything back to the cave. Others say the Ecuadorian government took possession of these artifacts. There are many theories as to where everything went. Uh, some of the artifacts appeared to be Babylonian in style. Others appeared to have been carved in gold with strange motifs and symbols that did not resemble objects from any South American culture. Uh, some of the gold plates appear to show a type of ancient writing, although as far as we are aware, none of them were identified or translated. The story goes there is still a huge underground city in the heart of Ecuador, jungle, waiting to be found. More than likely, it has been found, but those who found it aren't letting us in on the secret. You might ask, why would scientists hide valuable discoveries? Well, for one thing, let's say you're working at a big university. You have based your entire teaching career on evidence you found saying all the people living in the Americas came here by way of that land bridge crossing the Bering Straits. Then, along comes some upstart with new evidence saying the people living here came by way of ship. You could pack your bags and retire, settle down to a less than comfortable life, or you could pile derision on this upstart. You could get people who also have a deep interest in keeping the same story going to mock them and make all their research go away. There's also the idea that at one time a lie was started saying this is how things were as the United States was being built. That lie led to thousands of people being murdered. Would anybody want to come forward and say their predecessors were involved in such a despicable event? The Smithsonian would have a lot of explaining to do as to why they destroyed so many artifacts as well as people's reputations. Maybe it's just some elitist group that think we're not worthy of knowing the truth. Knowledge is power and some don't like to share. If you have any stories you'd like to share for my next book, send me a note. You can reach me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. That's A R C A N A S A dot com. Now, just as long as the stories are true, I'll put them down on paper. I don't want to hear anything that you heard on the TV or the radio. If you heard it from your grandfather, your grandmother, your next-door neighbor, that's fine. Send them to me. I'll put them into a readable form. I'll send it back to you so you can approve it. Then we'll put it into a book. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, let your friends and relatives know what they're missing. Till next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you... Coming to the tree With a strong upper man The same murder three Strange things did happen here No stranger would it be If we met at midnight In the hanging tree